Hi everyone, it's Alia, one of the residents at Nakuma Hospital. Today we're going through obstetric emergencies, which is a huge topic, one we probably won't be able to cover in detail today. I'll do my best to get through um, the more high yield stuff for your exams and your practice. A few things to keep in mind before we get started. Um, obviously, there are so many changes in your physiology during pregnancy, um, which is a whole nother lecture in itself. So I'd really encourage you to be more familiar with that aspect of pregnancy and to really keep in mind that you're dealing with two patients and not just the one. So you're dealing with the mom and the baby. And in many um, cases, people would consider the baby to be one of the vital organs. Um, and that will be a bit more apparent when we go into things like preeclampsia later on. You'll find as we go through the lecture that um, in most cases, the definitive um, answer or treatment for that condition will be delivery. Um, and the um, degree to which this is imminent or can wait a few days um, depends on certain either maternal or fetal um, factors. And these revolve around whether there is a threat to either of those lives. And we'll cover all of these in a bit more detail. So I've divided it into things that um, can occur to the mom and things that can occur to the baby. But it's really important to keep in mind, as we said, that regardless of who is being affected or um, which aspect of the pregnancy is um, underlying the emergency that you have both patients to care for and treat and manage, not just the one. And so first we'll go through an antepartum hemorrhage. Um, this is just a quick overview on the sort of algorithm you'd go through to managing um, this uh, bleeding in uh, the third trimester of pregnancy. And while this is just an overview, it also highlights an important point that will be revisited many times throughout this lecture. Um, and that is that, um, you know, if you're suspecting one of these obstetric emergencies or it's very clear that they're um, happening, you need to assess whether the patient needs resuscitation, um, whether you need to call in for help, so calling the met call, calling your senior, getting some extra hands in, getting some access, going through, going back to basics and going through your airway, breathing, circulation, uh, which applies really to any emergency, not just obstetric emergencies. So it's a good um, habit to get into. It's a good mindset to have. As we mentioned, antepartum hemorrhages occur in the third trimester of pregnancy. And uh, it's really a range of um, bleeding. So it can be anything from spotting, um, just staining on a pad or on the underwear, to a minor hemorrhage of blood loss around 50 mils or less, um, to a major hemorrhage, which is up to a liter of blood loss, and massive hemorrhage, which is more than a liter of blood loss um, with signs of shock. There are obviously um, several different causes. Um, it can be placental causes. Um, the placenta is a really highly vascular organ, um, and so it can uh, predispose to a lot of issues during pregnancy, leading to an antepartum hemorrhage. Um, other things, such as um, more superficial lacerations in the vagina or the vulva, um, a cervical atropion, um, infection or you know if they've recently had intercourse um, or abdominal trauma that can also um, cause an antepartum hemorrhage and in this talk I just wanted to hone in on the placental causes um, they're usually divided into painful APH versus a painless APH and um, painless ones usually caused by either placenta previa which is a low-lying placenta close to the internal cervical os, um, either very near to it or 
covering it to um, uh, partially or fully. And as we mentioned, the placenta being a highly vascular organ, um, this can predispose to a lot of bleeding. Um, similarly, a vasa previa is where the, um, the umbilical vessels cross the internal cervical os. And while both of these are, um, the presence of either of these are not emergent in themselves, they are um, putting both um, the baby and the mother at higher risk of a um, hemorrhage and um, large amounts of bleeding. For example, with a phase of previa, um, usually it will present with painless vaginal bleeding after a rupture of membranes. Um, and given that the vessels carrying um, oxygen and blood um, to the baby, um, rupturing these can cause um, a large amount of exsanguination. If you think about how small a newborn baby is, the amount of blood that um, circulates is only a few hundred mils, and so you can lose all that in a matter of minutes. So that is definitely an emergency. And the reason why people avoid digital um, examinations in these patients. Other causes um, which cause painful bleeding, like a, a placental abruption and uterine rupture, we'll go into a bit more detail. So placental abruption is when the placenta um, detaches from the wall of the uterus and presents with um, a painful um, abdomen or back pain with a continuous bleeding either through the vagina or it can be, if it occurs higher up in the uterus, it can be concealed within the abdomen, um, but they will have a very rigid, um, woody, tender uterus on palpation. Um, and if you're monitoring the baby on the CTG, um, it might show signs of distress, so fetal bradycardia or some decelerations. The risk factors for an abruption, and this uh, it's the case for almost every condition in pregnancy, is that if they've had a previous um, abruption, they will be predisposed to another one during this pregnancy. Um, other things such as preeclampsia, advanced maternal age, so greater than 40 years old, um, multiparity, so um, having had um, many pregnancies before, smoking and um, things like methamphetamines or cocaine, which can affect um, the vasculature. Um, any abdominal trauma can also predispose you to an abruption. And so if you are suspecting this, you definitely, definitely want to get help. You want to get the obstetricians in, um, you want to get more hands on board, you want to um, check their airways, breathing, circulation. Um, they can lose a lot of blood very quickly, so you want to get access and um, fluid resuscitate them if they're very hypotensive and tachycardic. And um, as we mentioned before, definitively, um, you would want to get the baby and uh, consequently the placenta out. Um, and if it occurs quite early on in pregnancy, the mother is hemodynamically stable, um, you may consider just a period of observation and bed rest rather than rushing to deliver, but um, if she's very unstable, then um, the only definitive way to stop the bleeding and to, to treat both the mom and the baby would be to deliver. So uterine rupture is one of the risks of having a vaginal birth after cesarean. Um, the things that predispose you to this is um, anything that can weaken the uterine wall and muscle. So with previous users, you have the scar tissue there, um, which is a sort of weak um, aspect of the uterus there. Um, and the 
classical um, incisions, which are the the longitudinal ones rather than the horizontal lower segment cesarean sections that are usually done today. Those, um, uh, I guess, old school classical ones are at higher risk um, just with the way the muscles um, heal and, and form together. Um, with induction or augmentation of labor using an oxytocin infusion, um, which is to help the uterus contract um, during labor that can tire the uterus out and um, cause it to be quite weak and which can predispose to a rupture. These will present um, suddenly, typically during labor, um, and they'll have severe abdominal pain. Uh, you might see some fetal distress. And similarly, with uh, such as with the um, placental abruptions, you want to get help as soon as possible. You want to um, do your ABCDs and resuscitate the mother and get them to delivery as soon as possible. And if, if they can, they will try and repair the uterus, but um, you may need to proceed to a hysterectomy if that's not possible. So preeclampsia. Um, we'll talk about preeclampsia, eclampsia and help syndrome, which are sort of an umbrella of disorders um, during pregnancy. Preeclampsia is when you get hypertension in pregnancy, which is um, systolic of more than 140, or a diastolic of more than 90 um, after 20 weeks of pregnancy. Um, if you have the hypertension plus um, one or more organ system dysfunction, and um, these include um, renal, hematological, um, hepatic, neurological, and as we mentioned before, baby being a vital organ um, and cardiorespiratory compromise. The presence of hypertension without um, the involvement of these organ systems um, is gestational hypertension. Um, risk factors that will predispose you to preeclampsia is um, if it's your first pregnancy, so if you're a prima gravida, um, multiple gestations, so twins, triplets, um, obesity, advanced maternal age, um, if they've had previous preeclampsia, as we mentioned, previous disorders in pregnancy predispose you to having them again, um, and if you've had a pregnancy interval of more than 10 years. When we talk about organ involvement um, with the renal system, um, you're looking at significant proteinuria and a raise in creatinine. Um, I think 90 is still within normal range for um, other demographics. Um, however, in pregnancy, more than 90 is when you start to suspect um, compromising renal function. Um, and another way to measure it is oliguria. Uh, in terms of the hematological system, um, you're looking at low platelets, thrombocytopenia, um, any hemolysis. Um, with the liver, you're looking at a transaminitis um, and whether they've got um, epigastric or right upper quadrant pain. Um, neurological, and we'll get a bit more into this when we talk about eclampsia, um, they can get seizures, um, they can be quite hyperreflexive and um, present with some headache or visual disturbances, um, and that can be quite dangerous. Um, they can also present with edema, um, either quite sudden onset peripheral edema, or they can have um, respiratory compromise with some pulmonary edema. And of course, it can also lead to growth restriction um, with abnormal blood flow to the baby. You want to assess them 
um, with your history, so the things we mentioned before, seeing whether they have any headaches, any visual disturbances, um, see if they've had any abdominal pain, particularly epigastric or right upper quadrant pain, any sudden increase in peripheral edema, uh, which can be a bit hard to distinguish because um, it is quite normal pregnancy to have some degree of peripheral edema, but if that has um, suddenly changed over quite a short period of time, um, that's a bit more concerning. On examination, very similarly, look at whether they have any abdominal tenderness in those areas, um, any hyperreflexia, um, or any chloroness. And similarly with your bloods, what you're looking for is any evidence of those organ dysfunctions. So you look at your fluid blood count, checking the platelets, checking the hemoglobin, and if there's any suspicion that there might be um, hemolysis, then you can put on your hemolytic screen and, um, and coags as well. Um, you look at your um, EUCs, which can show you your creatinine, your renal function. You'd also send off a urine PCR, see if there's any proteinuria. Um, you'd look at your LFTs and um, particularly your AST and ALT to make sure they're not raised. Urate is usually taken with preeclampsia bloods, um, but it is not a diagnostic feature. It's something um, used to prognosticate the extent of the disease. And of course, monitor baby via CTG. So management of preeclampsia being primarily a hypertensive disorder um, is targeted at blood pressure control. And unlike um, in the normal adult population, um, ACE inhibitors are not a good idea in pregnancy. Um, usually you'd see most pregnant ladies on labetalol, that's um, quite commonly used. Um, the, um, the other one is methyl dopa, um, but any of the agents you see here can be used in pregnancy and it's really up to the discretion of the treating doctor. And you're aiming for those um, targets, so lowering the blood pressure below um, 140 systolic or 90 diastolic. Ultimately, it's a disorder um, caused by the placenta, so um, if blood pressure is really, really not um, being well controlled under any um, oral antihypertensives, then you'd need to consider delivery, um, as that's really the main definitive treatment. Um, there is a small risk of um, preeclampsia and developing eclampsia in the days postpartum as well, so um, they'll need to be monitored at that stage as well. One very important thing to know is that um, giving fluids is not a routine thing in preeclampsia and it's actually quite um, discouraged if you can help it. Um, there is endothelial damage and increased vascular permeability associated with um, preeclampsia, so giving large volumes of IV fluids can um, cause or worsen pulmonary edema and um, peripheral edema, um, so we try to avoid that if possible. Now, eclampsia, as we touched on earlier, is a complication of preeclampsia, and it's where um, the hypertension results in uh, seizures, um, which are typically tonic clonic in nature. Um, it is really important if someone presents with seizures in pregnancy that you rule out other causes. Um, so whether it's caused by an underlying epilepsy or, um, or a central venous thrombus, um, whether they have hypoglycemia and your um, investigations will be based around this. Ultimately, you want to, as always, resuscitate, um, go through your ABCDs. If the seizure is prolonged, usually it will the last couple minutes, um, you can consider um, some benzodiazepines to terminate the seizure earlier. Typically, you give a magnesium sulfate infusion 
and you'd have to very closely monitor their blood pressure as it can cause widespread vasodilation, um, monitor their respiratory rate, um, urine output, and their deep tendon reflexes. As with the preeclampsia, you need to control the hypertension um, and arrange for delivery um, as soon as possible. HELP syndrome is thought to be a complication of preeclampsia, but it can occur in the absence of hypertension or other features of preeclampsia. Um, generally, women present in the third trimester with sort of generalized um, feeling of being unwell, every gastric pain, right upper quadrant tenderness, um, some vomiting, nausea, headache, very non-specific symptoms, which can actually lead to quite a delay in diagnosis. Um, but um, they'll, you'll find on their investigations that they'll have evidence of hemolysis, low platelets, um, elevated liver enzymes or transaminitis, um, and uh, complications that can arise from HELP syndrome include disseminated intravascular coagulation, uh, pulmonary edema and respiratory compromise, um, as well as liver dysfunction. If um, it's quite early on in pregnancy and you're not trying to avoid delivery straight away, the management is revolved around supportive measures, ensuring that um, they're receiving good respiratory support if needed, controlling their blood pressure if it's elevated, um, observing for hemorrhage in the context of low platelets where they can bleed out quite quickly. But ultimately, again, you would want to deliver um, when possible. And you'd monitor um, worsening or um, stability of HELP syndrome with the lactic dehydrogenase and the platelet count. If um, it's fairly early on in pregnancy and it may result in a premature delivery, you can give corticosteroid to help um, mature the fetal lungs prior to delivery. But ultimately, this decision will depend on the stability of the mother's hemodynamics and the facilities available for delivery. And postpartum hemorrhages are defined as a blood loss um, from immediately after delivery up to 12 weeks. Um, it's a blood loss of 500 mils or more. You can have primary PPH, which is within the first 24 hours, and secondary PPH, which is um, 24 hours to 12 weeks um, after giving birth. And um, it can also be divided into minor, up to a liter, and major, which is more than a liter. Um, risk factors um, for PPH would be previous PPH, um, a high BMI, multiple gestations, um, and these will make sense when we go through the causes, um, induction of labor, multiparity, and a placenta previa, and about maternal age. The causes um, can be split up into the four T's. Um, the Majority of um, the time it will be caused by a uterine atony, um, where the uterus is all floppy and cannot contract down to stop the bleeding. Uh, <clears throat> and you can sort of infer this from the risk factors. So if you're um, going through induction of labor, um, where the oxytocin is causing the uterus to continually contract and um, tiring the uterus out, you can get quite atonic. Um, if you have multiple gestations, the uterus has to expand to accommodate more than one fetus, and so um, that can sort of stretch it out and make it atonic as well. Other causes can be trauma, particularly um, during cesareans, um, trauma to any of the major arteries or vessels, tissue um, being retained products of conception, um, where the placenta is incompletely removed, and any um, coagulopathies as well. 
once again, you want to do your basic life support assessment, um, resuscitate them, get your group in hold so that you can um, transfuse if needed, um, find out what the hemoglobin is, um, do your coagulation profile, activate a massive transfusion protocol if needed. You ultimately want to stop the bleeding, so um, this can be done with a Bakri balloon that's inserted into the uterus and um, just a balloon filled with water uh, which is blown up to, to try and tap them out the bleeding. You can also give things like um, tranexamic acid and um, ergometrine. Um, usually with a postpartum hemorrhage you give 40 units of um, intravenous oxytocin um, as an infusion to help the uterus contract down and stop the bleeding. Um, also manually doing a bundle rub, um, which is quite an aggressive massage of the uterus, um, both from the inside and the, and the outside on the abdomen. If there's um, evidence of trauma, you want to make sure that you suture or ligate or embolize the bleeding vessel. Um, any retained products of conception need to be removed, so they may need to be taken back to theater um, or going for a dilatation curettage. And if there's any coagulopathy, that needs to be corrected as well. Um, if none of those um, interventions are working, then um, the very last protocol would be to consider a hysterectomy. Um, amniotic fluid embolism is something that is very, very rare. It can present with a maternal collapse, um, respiratory arrest or hypoxia, um, shock and hypotension, um, severe hemorrhage, um, seizures. It's um, thought to be when there is exposure of amniotic fluid to the maternal circulation and can only really be definitively diagnosed um, histologically on a postmortem. But anything that can increase the risk of, of the mixing of amniotic fluid um, to maternal circulation, so having a, a cesarean or an instrumental delivery, a uterine rupture, um, a placental abruption, any lacerations, just anything that can mix the blood with the amniotic fluid. Um, can predispose you to this. The presentation is pretty non-specific, so um, you'll need to consider many other differentials, including a PV, um, you know, anaphylaxis, sepsis, um, eclampsia, even a myocardial infarction. But ultimately, um, you'll want to stabilize the patient as usual, resuscitate them, do bloods and ECG, chest X-ray. Um, if only to rule out other differentials, ultimately supportive management and um, delivering them if this presents antenatally. So shoulder dystocia is during labor um, once the head is delivered, um, the baby's shoulders, either the anterior or posterior shoulder, are impacted within the um, maternal pelvis, and this can lead to hypoxia and a brachial plexus injury. Um, risk factors for shoulder dystocia include um, macrosomia, gestational diabetes, um, previous shoulder dystocia, um, a high maternal BMI, um, induction of labor and um, a prolonged um, first or second stage of labor. This typically occurs, as you can see, um, during the, the second stage here where the, um, there's rotation and delivery of the anterior shoulder, that's where the baby can get stuck and um, cause the shoulder dystocia. Now, management, you're definitely going to want a lot of hands in this. Um, you want the mother to stop 
pushing because um, that can impact the shoulder even more. There are a few maneuvers you can try. So McRoberts where you're putting legs up um, to try and open open the pelvic outlet more. Um, so hyperflexing mom's hips, knees to the chest. And apply some super pubic pressure, which will go behind the anterior shoulder and try to disimpact it. Um, failing these two, you can try and deliver the posterior arm. So if the anterior arm is, is stuck, you can try and get the posterior out and then decrease the um, baby's surface area that needs to come out. Or you can try and apply pressure um, in the front of one and of one shoulder and behind the other shoulder, so in a corkscrew style um, maneuver and movement. And if any of these fail, um, assuming the mom's laying on her back to deliver, um, you can also turn her onto all fours and try um, try these again. Finally, we've got umbilical cord prolapse where um, the umbilical cord is protruding through the cervix after the rupture of membranes. And this can be very dangerous because um, as the baby's head descends in labor and contractions occur, it can cause occlusion of the blood flow throughout these umbilical cord vessels. Um, and can also cause vasospasm when it's um, exposed to the outside air, um, which are both um, impeding delivery of blood and oxygen to the baby. And so um, risk factors for umbilical cord prolapse um, or cord presentation would be an unstable lie, um, you know, a rupture in membranes when the presenting part hasn't descended into the pelvis, um, because the cord can move around before it, um, it descends. Polyhydramnia, so um, an excess of amniotic fluid, prematurity or a breech presentation. And you can mitigate this by um, manually elevating the presenting part, um, sort of positioning the mother and, and using your hand to, to keep the presenting part off the umbilical cord and prevent that. Um, occlusion of blood flow. Ultimately, you'd want to get them to theater and deliver as soon as possible. Okay, so I hope that helped. It was a very brief overview and would be very well supplemented if you um, go through a bit more of the physiology of pregnancy. Um, but these are the main obstetric emergencies that we encounter. And the main thing I, I really would like you to keep in mind is that um, you have the two patients here, you have the mom and the baby, and everything you do in all these cases should be aimed at the best outcome for both. Thanks for listening.